Allison Davidson. How are you doing? This is our Tapping Liberation Home Study course. This is the Emotional Brilliance Healing Process. We're looking at module number two, actually, which is the second chakra. And the sort of a spectrum of emotions or uh, sort of experiences that are covered here. And as you'll see, there's a lot going on in the second chakra. So let's go ahead and get started. So the toxic emotion that is held in the second chakra, I refer to it as grasping, craving, longing, or lust. It is that, it's sort of based on that fear that um, there's these pleasurable experiences that I want and that I need and that I desire and I'm going to grasp a hold of them. It's this sort of decision that that something that happened in the past, some sensation, some experience, some emotion was so powerful and so pleasurable that it is a much better state of mind to be in than the one that I'm in. And so what the, the psyche does, what your ego does, it starts grasping uh, a hold of those pleasurable experiences and memories, wanting you to recreate them and recreate them and recreate them. And what happens is that we miss the fabulousness and the richness of the present moment because we're seeking pleasurable experiences like ones we had before. And so we get into chronic situations and circumstances and behavior patterns that have us grasping for sensations and pleasures that are based on past experience as opposed to actually being present in our bodies centered, open, aware, engaged, fully present to the moment in savoring the pleasures that actually arise when we really are grounded uh, and in the present moment. The, the voice, the sort of enlightened aspect of this is deep desire. And the tone that I use for working with the chakra, the vowel sound is the, as in the. So it's that sort of, it's a short E, uh, and when I'm toning with it, I often will just simply say the, so that I really get the sound uh, correct. So the second chakra is just a couple of inches below your belly button, and then just sitting in front of your spinal column. So it's behind the guts, it's behind the reproductive organs. Uh, in the body. And it's really, as my friend Margaret uh, Lynch says, it's where money and sex and power all come together. The second chakra uh, is that energetic center in the yogic tradition, in the Asian martial arts system. It's called the Dantian. In um, Korea and Japan, it's called the Hara. And it's a very, very powerful center. It's really the first center of power that we have to master uh, in our lives. It's, if you're looking at the body just below the belly button there, that two inches below the belly button, it's the gravitational center of your entire body. If you watch the beautiful martial arts movies, if you've seen The Matrix, all that exquisite movement that they do in any martial arts combative style comes from this energetic center. And so the whole trunk of the body and the limbs all follow the movement of this Dantian, or the Hara, second chakra. That's why lust, longing, greed, envy, um, cravings of any kind, it's really the sort of the center of addiction and compulsion here because uh, we're trying to recreate past experiences and pleasures and sensations 
that um, we decided were fabulous and that's what we should experience over and over and over again. So I want to just be, to clarify something because desire um, sort of has a bad rap in our culture and it also has a bad rap in the spiritual tradition. So it's a really important distinction to make. Uh, the dictionary defines it, desire is to wish or to long for, to crave and to want. A longing or craving as something that brings satisfaction or enjoyment. So that's sort of even a negative twist on desiring. And certainly in the spiritual traditions and, you know, in the Christian traditions, you know, if you look at the seven deadly sins, uh, lust, uh, envy uh, are two of the deadly sins. If you look in the Eastern traditions from the Hindu, the Taoist, the Buddhist traditions, um, desire is one of those impulses of the psyche and the self that uh, should be conquered and transcended. But I want to twist that around for you just a little bit because here's a quote from the Buddha. The Buddha said, have desire, make them big ones. So if you're on a spiritual path, you are desiring, you're longing for whether it's freedom, liberation, happiness, enlightenment, whatever it is, it is a longing, it's a deep desire for. And so that's why this, um, the voice of enlightenment comes from what I call deep desire. So it's in that place of enlightened awareness, fully embodied awareness, and yet desiring to be uh, in complete alignment with the universal good, the unfolding of the Tao, the evolutionary impulses of creation and evolution and consciousness. Um, so there's that desire there. So have big desires for your life. And so certainly we need to work with those um, cravings or lustful thoughts or behaviors that pull us away from our deepest virtues and values that uh, we have in our sort of that are the guideposts for our lives. So here are the poisonous emotions, just some of them yearning, longing, needy, lust, lewdness, jealousy, envy, craving, grasping, attachment, obsession, fixation, dependence, um, greedy, uh, addiction, and I make a very important distinction uh, in my own life and my own work. Addiction is the actual physical addiction to a, a, a substance. So whether that is heroin, or nicotine, or some body chemical that's created, um, we have an addiction to it. And then there is a dependency or a compulsion, which is mostly psychological. If so, whether it's shopping or gambling or uh, you know, pornography or whatever that might be, it obviously creates a chemical reaction in our brains, but it is definitely the... Um, you know, it's, the, it's an external behavior that generates that rush of endorsements that gives us the, the pleasure and the thrill that we're looking for. So uh, a physical addiction versus a, a, a dependency or compulsion. Okay, so I also want to make an important distinction here as we sort of look at the spiritual nuances of desire and attachment. And, you know, so many of us attach to memories and people and circumstances and places. And one of the things that I've noticed now that I'm 50-something years old is that I often think about the old days, you know, the 1980s when the music was fun and we were hip and young and had the energy to dance all night. You know, it's easy to look back at the old days and to think that they're they're romanticized and, and better than what's going on today. But then the flip side of expectation is that I'm go, I, you know, I'm going to take an action and then here is my expected result from that. 
is I've developed this quality of discernment in my own moral intelligence. And it's like I sort of can get a sense of what is going to happen, what's the, the cause and effect, the ripple effect that's going to happen if I take a particular action and make a certain choice. And I get attached to those results. I expect things to turn out a particular way. And when they don't, I'm disappointed or confused or frustrated or angry or grieving or whatever. do our, our very best to be present to the truth as it arises in the moment and to make our choices uh, guided by that truth and alignment with that truth and then we let go of the attachment of the results and we just have to sort of recalibrate moment to moment to moment because it's when I'm attaching to a result from an action that I make um, and we see that uh, certainly in people um, so many people think about love, and I'm in love with somebody, and I do this for them. But if we look at that strictly from the place of the ego and the self, it really is a business transaction. I'm going to do this for you so that you will love me, that you will continue to embrace me and hold me, and I have your attention, and you continue to give me energy, give me your love. So that's what I call that. That's a business transaction. That's not really the experience of love, or at least it's the experience of love from the lower self. Then when we begin to shift into the levels of enlightenment, the non-self, or then you know transcending, including, and integrating all those and as we live into our true selves, then that just simply becomes a piece of the puzzle. But the key is to cut away this attachment that we have, this expectation that we have for certain results. OK. <clears throat> so I know a lot of people that I work with have cravings. And now whether that is a craving for a food substance or if it's a craving for, uh, you know, even I know athletes or people who run or compete in certain ways, they have a craving for a certain endorphin rush. So they will run a marathon so that they get that runner's high, or they will train um, you know, for a bicycling event, or in a martial arts, or in a dance arts, or something, because they get a certain response. So there is a difference in doing a sport, or doing a dance, or doing a, a certain behavior for the simple pleasure and joy of doing it, and then versus needing the chemical response of my own body to change my reality. So whether that's food um, or heroin or nicotine or alcohol or, or some other behavior that is a mood-altering behavior, then the thing to begin to look at is we're substituting an external behavior or substance for what we need internally. We might need to create our own sense of excitement and engagement and affection in our own lives and have a real genuine intimacy not only with ourselves, but then bring that intimacy to the people in our lives. So uh, my friend Brittany Watkins always asks the question, if you're craving, what is it you're genuinely wanting and desiring in your life? as opposed to, OK, I'll settle for something from the refrigerator, or I'll settle for a cigarette. So that's one way to look at the cravings. I also want to point out um, how many of our behaviors are really habitual. There are so many things that we do in a day, from tying our shoes, to driving, to you know the routes we take to the dry cleaners or the manicurist or the grocery store or to work or 
whatever it is, we do things habitually. And so um, there was a study done at Duke University a few years ago that talked about over 50% of the scientific study about habits and how they're formed and how to change them. And also, the author is just an amazing storyteller. Really, really good examples and stories of people changing at a personal level, at a family level, at a cultural level, a corporate level, all kinds of, of behaviors that we can change and how to do them. In, in its simplest form, those of us that uh, use habits, there's a particular cue, a sensory cue, or an environmental cue. We go through a certain specific routine, and then we're rewarded for that cue. Uh, and then the cycle just repeats itself and repeats itself. So here uh, it is sort of spelled out the, uh, the habit loop is what that's called. That, circuit between cue, ritual, and reward. Um, and what happens is the cue is the signal. We have the behavior pattern, which is a routine, which we run automatically in our mind. And then we get the reward, the neurological satisfaction and pleasure and happiness of, of achieving that particular routine. Now, what happens with the brain is that over time, the physical environmental cue happens in the world, and our brain actually starts rewarding us before we get to the routine. And that is when we start craving a substance, whether it's an external behavior or an internal, um, you know, like food or nicotine or something like that, alcohol. Um, so it's when the circuit actually becomes sort of intertwined in our own thinking. And that really is the distinction between someone who has a compulsive behavior and an addiction is somebody who really starts salivating. There's an environmental cue of, say, you walk by a bakery and you happen to smell some foods or see some foods in the window, and then your brain actually starts producing the endorphins and the serotonin that is produced when you eat certain substances. And so you begin craving those foods to actually then deliver the experience uh, that your mind is already creating for you. And so um, the habit loop then simply becomes, how do I have a particular environmental behavior? I create a brand new routine instead of eating something from the bakery. I do something else, I go for a long walk along the river that gives me a very similar pleasurable neurological response. It's not the same, but it's close enough. So I actually begin to train my brain and train my life that, oh, here's a particular environmental cue. It's a trigger for me, but instead of taking one, I'm going to go to the refrigerator and grab something tasty. I'm going to actually uh, maybe you know go to the back office and do a little uh, EFT tapping or something like that. Or I'm actually going to look at my life partner and say, let's go for a walk and have a heartfelt conversation instead of raiding the refrigerator and watching television. So that's a way of creating a new routine that's going to give us a different reward but still satisfies the brain and still satisfies the self. And it's much more healthy and healing for us. So here's an example of you know, those of us that crave attention and appreciation. So there's the cue. 
And then there's the routine. We slip into our persona, super achiever persona, or golden boy or golden girl, or you know whatever it is we do, and um, and then we uh, are desperate for the reward that uh, people give us. You know the attention, the accolades, the appreciation that comes from that. So again, it's a habit loop that we've created. There's a challenge. I know I can do it well. I can ace it. And then I'm going to get you know lots of kudos for that. And so how do we break that, that cycle within the ego that is so desperate for other people's appreciation and attention? And so here's the challenge. And the conscious mind will step back and say, how can I best be in service of here? Can I be, actually become a leader of a team of people that will solve the problem instead of having to step in and save the day? And focus on the joys and pleasures of being a good leader in the intimacy and the heartfelt connection of being a leader and then allowing the team to get the rewards. So it's just a subtle shift in intention and expectation, but it creates a different result for you and allows the ego to actually grow and expand and open as opposed to stay stuck in a particular role and persona and way of doing things. Also, um, one of the last points I want to make for the second chakra here is this sense of grasping. And I, I want you to think of a crab and the way that a crab or a lobster will grab a hold of something and it simply will not let go. I often think in my astrology training, the, the zodiac sign of cancer is ruled by the crab. And if you know many cancers, you know that emotionally they can grab a hold of something and they're not willing to let go very easily. So there's that sense of a grasping, but there's also a tightening. There's a contraction of, I've got to hold on to this. I'm not letting go of this for dear life. And so it's really a place of kind of locking down, you know, entrenching oneself. I'm going to hold on to this. I'm going to hold on to this beautiful, enlightened state of this experience I've just had. Or I'm going to hold on to this beautiful memory or that moment of deep in us, in intimacy that I had with a friend or with my lover or my partner. And so there's a contraction that happens. It's a holding on. And one of the things that um, I think about as a body worker and talking about fully enlightened, fully embodied enlightenment and awareness is what happens to our actual bones and connective tissues and muscles when we have a, a habit of grasping and contracting and holding on in a specific way. And so I just want to talk to you a moment about body armoring and the sort of sense of grasping. And I always think about our, our posture is a mirror to the physical expression of our psyche and our mental health. And um, so you can see here's a woman who's actually modeling different points. And so the, the image on the far left actually looks like pretty good posture. You know, that line, you know, from the ears through the shoulders, through the pelvis, and then on down to the feet is pretty much in alignment. And the, the curvature of the, the spine, the back of the neck, and then the small of the back, pretty balanced. But then if you start to look at the three images uh, to the right of that, you can see where at certain points the line begins to shift. And this uh, image, the third image from the left, um, that's uh, something that uh, I think in terms of the green light syndrome, it's like you can see how the belly is really collapsed and uh, thrust out there and the spine is out of alignment. And that's a sense of sort of poor boundaries psychologically that uh, sort of moving into that poor me, the doormat, you know, I don't know how to say no powerfully and clearly when I mean it. Um, and then if you look at the far right, 
then that's almost the red light. If you look, it looks like you know the person was almost punched in the heart, so the, the chest is moved back, and there's this complete out of balance, so that's the, the red light um, response to life. And those psychological points of view um, you know, begin to get locked into the body. That's where um, a behavior pattern actually becomes entrenched in the connective tissues of the body, and the skeleton gets distorted. So Wilhelm Reich was one of the first Western psychologists who really talk about the importance of posture in the healing process and change. And he believed that you could not deal with any kind of neurosis or psychosis until you made actual changes in the physical body. And that's why Rolfing uh, and its many variations are so powerful because the Rolfing goes in and touches aspects of the muscles and the connective tissues that are really rarely felt excuse me, and then helps to free up that uh, armoring, that contracting, that habitual way of holding the body so that there's more movement, there's more freedom, and the skeleton can return to its natural place of alignment, which then actually allows the mind to return to a place of more spaciousness and freedom, centeredness and balance. Now we have to begin new movement patterns, new thinking patterns, new emotional patterns to support this realignment. But it's so vital to have um, the body supporting this place of centeredness and groundness and freedom so that we're not contracting, we're not grasping, we're not holding on to old ways of being in our lives. So deep desire, it's that place of shifting into fully enlightened, fully embodied mastership, where you're present to the delights and the pleasures of the moment as they arise, and, and that you have your deep desires. And whatever they are for you, Having all, all that alignment then really allows your goals, your dreams, and your visions for your life to become manifest and embodied. So there you go. So we come to now the demonstration. So this completes sort of our introduction to the second chakra and the toxic emotions of cravings, lust, and envy that are held here. And so you'll see the, de um, the demo for you uh, in the video below. And as usual, just remember, as I am demonstrating with um, Deborah, who is the echo for this demonstration, as she's remembering memory number one and the intensity level, write that for yourself. And as she regresses to the second memory, allow your own mind to be guided and stilled and to re-experience what's true for you. And then as we're tapping with Deborah, uh, even though I'm, she's the echo and we're focusing specifically on her experience and her memories, nine times out of ten, um, if you tap along with us, you will have a clarity and a clearing and a healing in your own memories and experiences, and the intensity level will drop and, and often come to a zero just by, by tapping along with Deborah's experience. Always checking, you know, at that earliest memory that's safe and appropriate to have at this time, what's the decision that you made about yourself, your family, and your life, the world that we live in from this experience. And then finally, as we work with Deborah and actually go back to that voice of mastership, fully enlightened, fully embodied master, then what's the new decision that you choose to make about your life? So that's it. 
that's our process for today. I really appreciate your watching and your listening and your tapping and the energy of, of really doing this work and going deep for healing.